Your War and Navy Departments present December 7th. Would you please repeat the last paragraph I gave you, Miss Kim? Certainly, Uncle Sam. For tropical beauty, and I'm not excluding the opposite sex, this little island of Oahu has no appeared as a vacation land. Fine. New paragraph. Imagine the transition, Jonathan. You hop a clipper in San Francisco, and in less than 24 hours, you're in paradise. Silence is the endless ringing of the telephone. Banished are Messrs. Hurry, Scurry, Worry and Company. Inaudible, the hubbub of labor disputes. Gone, the nerve-wracking feeling that the world in general is a whirling mess and that America in particular can't make up its mind which way it wants to spin, if at all. Yes, sir, Jonathan, when your corns begin to ache and bite, there's only one thing to do. Take your shoes off. And that's just exactly what I've done on a flower-covered hilltop in Honolulu, TH, Territory of Heaven, Hawaii, romantic, mystical Hawaii, where the air is choked with the fragrance of a million flowers. Air choked with the fragrance of a million flowers. Oh, yes, 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 Miss, I got carried away. <clears throat> All right, we'll, uh, we'll uh, continue. Yes, Jonathan, nature has been most generous. But there is more on this sun-gilded island than flowers and trees. I'll say there is. Oh, yes, you. Yes, I might have known. Uh, Miss Kim will uh, we'll, uh, continue with this later. The mood is gone. Go on with your letter. I might suggest a few things to add to it. They won't be as lyrical as the air choked with the fragrance of a million flowers, but they'll be as factual. You're not only an intruding gent, but a mule-eared eavesdropper as well. Thank you, Miss Kim. Good morning, Mr. C. Good morning, Miss Kim. You know, you're a strange fellow, U.S. One look at me and up goes your dander. Ah, that's no way to treat an old business partner. Old business partner, indeed. Well, let's say associate for many years. Too many years. Yes. A good long time. You were a youngster in knee pants when we first locked horns. You were tearing yourself into 13 parts over a book of rules you were getting up called uh, the Constitution. As I remember, it was up you and pulled all 13 parts of you into one solid hunk of oak. Then again, when you were a lanky, cocky adolescent, not quite 90 years old, you chose up sides and started knocking blocks off each other. Took quite a bit of reasoning with both sides. Yes, yes, and you've been reminding me of it ever since. Oh, well, that's my job. All right. What is it you want? I've come to go over the books with you. The year 1941 is nearly over, and there's some balancing to be done. You can't wait. I'm on a vacation. <laughs> you've done a lot of vacationing this year. The worst part of it, you haven't been having any fun. Your heart hasn't been in it, now has it? Well, of course, certainly, sure it has. <laughs> You can't fool me with that star-studded front of yours. You're not hitting on all 12. Something's eating you inside. Yes. You. Thank God for that. Thank God my small voice is able to reach you. That's what makes you, every 130 millionth part of you, a pretty decent fellow. Deep down underneath. Yes, you're a wily old scalawag, Mr. C, but I... Well, you can't hoodwink me with your flattery. No, sir. I'm on to your ways, and by Jehoshaphat, I'll be darned if I'm going to let you spoil my fun. You're not going to let me, but I will. <laughs> Since I had to be saddled with a conscience, why, dear Lord, did you have to hog-tie me to such an irascible, determined parasite like this one? 
<laughs> you see? Only a few minutes, and I got you praying already. All right, what's the use? Okay, let's take a look at the books. Uh, you're a good boy. Now, where shall we start? Anywhere, but let's get on with it. All right, now let's say Hawaii. I wonder how much you know about sugarcane and pineapples. Sugarcane and pineapples? Well, I don't know exactly what's behind that lawyer approach of yours, but I know a good deal about sugarcane and pineapples. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. It's a pioneering story that compares favorably with the opening of the West. It's a story of a miracle in an arid, sun-smitten desert created by a handful of adroit men with indomitable courage. They and their doughty descendants put into cultivation 244,000 acres of pest-free, strong, vigorous weeds, chucked full of sweet sap, an annual crop of two tons a century ago, a million tons today, over $50 million worth a year. Big business. On soil less favorable for growing cane, they planted pineapples. 90,000 acres under cultivation in half a century. About 13 million cases of canned fruit shipped yearly. Big business, too. Where once was a village of grass huts, a modern American city arose. Honolulu, the pearl of the Pacific. A modern, up-to-the-minute city. The territorial building, the municipal building, the library with its many branches. The University of Hawaii. The King Kamehameha School. Over 300 public and private schools. Honolulu Academy of Arts with its priceless collection of art and paintings. Lovely streets and homes. Beautiful houses of worship, representing all denominations. Luxurious hotels, the Royal Hawaiian and the Moana, on legendary Waikiki Beach. A bustling port, a haven for ships of all nations. And the Big Five, Castle and Cook, Alexander and Baldwin, C. Brewer and Company, Theo H. Davies and Company, American Factors, the Big Five, the Backbone, the Nerve Center, the Brain of the Territory, Grandsons, Aunts, Uncles, In-Laws, Held together by blood ties and interlocking directorates. Scratch one and the other bleeds. Yes, sir. That, my dear Mr. C, is what was accomplished with a sweet weed and a spiny pineapple in one century. And that's what I know about sugarcane and pineapples. As usual, you're very well informed. You've covered the subject perfectly, with one exception, labor. It took human hands to plow, till, and seed that desert soil, to irrigate it, fight the pests, harvest and gather the crop. Of course it did, and they've done a good job, too. They? Who are they? Why, uh, the natives. <laughs> You're a great one to play ostrich when you want to. You know as well as I do that the majority of laborers were and are Japanese. Well, what about it? Oh, nothing. But just for the record, let's not overlook the majority of the population here, the Japanese. They, too, had their pioneers. They didn't come here to spread the gospel or to venture in trade. They were brought here as contract laborers to supply the needed manpower for those Yankee pioneers who got here first. Back in the 1860s, they came in driblets, later in buckets full. Some saved their money and went back to the land of their fathers. Others, seeking better working conditions and broader opportunities, went on to the Pacific coast. Most of them, however, sank their roots, raised their families, buried their loved ones, and settled permanently. There are a lot of them now. 157,000. 37% of the population of the islands. That's their 1941 telephone book, published for them in Japanese. And that's their newspaper, published by them. They have several daily newspapers of their own, 
A few semi-weeklies and weeklies. They have their own magazines, too. A goodly share still work in the sugarcane plantations. A goodly share still work in the pineapple fields. But they develop their big five, too. Not as financially potent and powerful, but very solid indeed. Inch by inch, their sons, grandsons, uncles, aunts, cousins, began to penetrate into the industrial life of the island. And all the time, their numbers were growing. Merchants, fishermen, storekeepers, doctors, manufacturers, dentists, servants, truck farmers, nurses, ad infinitum. Yep, there are a lot of them. Yep, there are a lot of them, a hundred and fifty-seven thousand. And about a hundred and twenty thousand are full-fledged American citizens, don't forget that. Conduct themselves accordingly. Listen to what Dr. Shunzo Sakamaki chairman of the Oahu Citizens Committee for Home Defense had to say at a patriotic rally. We are not assembled here this evening to put on an act or a show. We want to carry our full share of the burden of national defense. We are here to re-pledge one with another our unreserved loyalty to the United States of America. This we do freely, gladly, proudly. There are those who question our sincerity, who doubt our loyalty. But if they would only pause and reflect, they would realize that there is no justification for such an attitude. After all, we were born here. Our homes, our friends, our livelihood, our future, are all deeply bound up with this native land of ours. We realize how fortunate we are to be living in this of all the lands of the earth, and we cherish our heritage as Americans. These are not mere words spoken for effect, with tongue in cheek, and we wish to add in unmistakable language, that if and when war comes, no matter with what other country, we will give our lives, if necessary, in defense of those democratic principles for which other Americans have lived and fought and died.
American a spirit as exists in any New England community, by gobs. A hyphenated spirit. Yes, they express their loyalty and no doubt are loyal. They send their children to American public schools where they pledge allegiance to the flag and sing patriotic American songs. But they also send them to their own language schools, 175 of them, where they're taught Japanese loyalties, culture and morals. to their Buddhist and Christian churches, they brought with them their so-called religion, Shintoism, and devoutly follow its teachings. Would you please tell us whom you recognize as a supreme being, as deity? In Shintoism, we worship the first Japanese emperor, whose creation started the world of mankind. Doesn't that imply worship of his descendants, the present son of heaven, Emperor Hirohito? He is the mortal image of our immortal deity. Do you mind telling us what are some of the basic precepts of your religion? Not at all. Shintoism embraces many doctrines. It preaches honor of the ancestors, thereby keeping alive the fires of nationalism and preserving a racial and social bond with the unbroken and divinely descended imperial dynasty. To be a Shintoist is to be a Japanese. This is not, nor can it be, a matter of choice. It is a duty. And they obey their duty. You're forgetting the guaranteeing freedom of religion. Is it an infringement of those rights to prohibit American citizens from worshiping the head of a foreign government? What, I ask you, my liberty-loving friend, would Tokyo think if the emperor's subjects openly worshiped George Washington as a god? Are you implying that all these, these people are disloyal Americans? Oh, no, indeed not. I wouldn't know would anyone undertake to separate the loyal from the disloyal. I'm only presenting the fact. Or enact what is commonly known as the Japanese Exclusion Act. There were about 66,000 American-born Japanese here. In that same year, Japan passed a law giving these 66,000 Americans the right to expatriate themselves from Japan. Yet up to 1933, only about 5,500 did. True, the expatriation procedure was made complicated and cumbersome by the Japanese government. Nevertheless, in that same period, between 1924 and 1933, 39,000 children were born to Japanese parents in Hawaii. But 17,800 of the parents went to the Japanese consulate here and registered their two-week-old sons and daughters so that they wouldn't lose their Japanese citizenship. If that's Americanism, it's very hyphenated. All right, all right. So there are many Japanese here, and they have their language schools and Shinto temples, and many are hyphenated and some perhaps disloyal. But don't go getting the impression that I'm entirely unaware of their presence here. My police forces, federal and local, are constantly vigilant, and backing them up is the largest naval fortress in the world. As long as the American flag flies over these bastions of military strength, no one need sleep uneasily. And let me remind you, it's a bastion I'm very proud of, just in case you've forgotten. I haven't forgotten, but neither have the Japanese. Ah, there you go again. No, this time I mean the Japanese imperial government, through its consulate general, 
and his 250 vice consuls, the Japanese consulate, diplomatically protected by the flag of the rising sun. ここ大きなカバンの中にまだ何が入っている。あ、ここには、え、写真性が撮った、いろいろな写真とまだその他にも報告書がみんな含んでいます。それは結構ちょっと見せてくれ。
我が日本の女に惚れてみんなの軍事的秘密を漏らしましたここにその女から来たヒッコンフィールドに関する詳しい報告があります Yes? Mr. Hanuman to see you. Have him come in. Thank you, Hannah. Good work. Good morning, Herr Hanuman. Hi, little gentleman. You seem in very good spirits today. Naturally. Of course I am. Haven't you seen the papers? An American destroyer was sunk in the North Atlantic by one of our submarines. My office can take credit for that. The information was picked up right here in Honolulu by one of my best men. About 10 o'clock, the phone rang. Long distance. And guess who? Brow. Well, he didn't say so in so many words, but we've got a little code fixed up. And he's been transferred to a cruiser and is leaving on Friday for Iceland. Just imagine Ralph in a cold country like that. Why, he's a regular old beach boy. Poor darling, probably freeze to death. Now look, Marco, remember, not a word to a single soul. I really shouldn't have told you. It's a military secret. It certainly was a military secret. Unfortunately, we didn't get the cruiser. But we did get one of the destroyers. My congratulations. You owe me more than congratulations. So? Surely you are not forgetting the fine work we are doing, telling the world what incompetent, stupid little children of the Orient you Japanese are. Lona, you've been playing too much around with the officers lately. Stop it. They're too smart for you. Tell your stories elsewhere. Giddy shops, card games, civilian workers. Talk to the public. Yes, Carl. And then this officer told me, he came through here on the Coolidge on his way back, that he'd give our Navy just about six weeks to wipe the Japs off the sea. He said the reason they're so secret about that Navy of theirs is that it's no good and they know it. All built of scrap metal we didn't want anymore anyway. I guess our experts know what a pile of junk it is. A friend of mine knows a Marine just back from China. Says the Japs never will make good pilots. You just have to have a flair for flying, I guess. And they ain't got it. This insurance fella, he's been in Tokyo for more than seven years. Saw lots of their planes flying over Tokyo. Slow, he says, sure weren't anything like ours. A newspaper fella who's been in Tokyo said their ships are just a lot of junk. Why, he says some of them just roll over and sink the first time their guns go off. And those Americans swallow it as easily as they do their indigestible popcorn. Well, Kida, I have something highly confidential to discuss with you. Certainly. Excuse us, Aga. Good morning. Our San Francisco office informs us that Washington has sent here many FBI agents and that military and naval intelligence men are practically everywhere. So they are. Warren? No, not very. I have information that one of the highest military officers in the Hawaiian department has cautioned everyone not to do anything which might offend the imperial government of Japan and create any unnecessary feeling among the local Japanese population. No action will be taken. And no action has been taken. How do you know all this? It's no secret. The Army and Navy have been aware of the Japanese spy activities for years. They even have a little black book, a grab list, of all suspicious persons, if and when trouble starts. Why isn't something being done about it before trouble starts? <laughs> I was going to ask you that, but I'll tell you. It's bad judgment to take a poke at a fellow's chin unless you're prepared to make it a 15-round scrap. Washington's on to Mr. Hirohito and company, but Washington has his hands full trying to keep the isolationists from disbanding the army and at the same time put our factories on a war footing. So, it's just a case of letting the Japanese push us around until you, every 130 millionth part of you, provides Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. Stimson, Mr. Hull, and Mr. Knox with good-sized clubs to back up their words with action. That's the kind of talk that's liable to get us into war. 
Why, that, they, that warmongering, eh? <laughs> As I've said many times, you're a strange fellow, U.S. You want peace, but you want it the easy way. You want to go on leading your way of life, but you don't want to fight for it. And if anyone suggests doing something about it, ha, he's called a warmonger. Watch out, U.S. Someday one of these incompetent, stupid little children of the Orient will choose you. And when they get ready to square off, they won't worry about offending you. They'll pick their time and their method. And they'll come over here and blow that bastion of military might behind which you sleep so easily into smithereens. Now you're hysterical. You're talking like a schoolboy. Remember, it's 3,400 miles from Tokyo to Hawaii. Oh, they may get cocky and try and pull a fast one in the Philippines. Or they might even be crazy enough to grapple with the British in Singapore. But it can't happen here. If their spies have been as active as you claim they have, there's one thing they surely must have found out, that Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Schofield, Wheeler, Shafter, all adds up to two words. Stay away. And they will. Well, they may. In the meantime, no matter the hour, no matter the place, there's an ear to hear and an eye to observe. Patiently, bit by bit, information is collected. Patiently, bit by bit, it is sent out. The ever-present diesel-powered sampan is used for other purposes besides fishing. The diplomatic pouch eliminates the need for secrecy. Thus, by short wave and diplomatic pouch, Tokyo is kept informed of all our ship movements and all our military activity. By patriotic subscription, they support the war in China. By low-cost tourist rates, thousands go back yearly to the homeland. In return, Tokyo sends over Shinto priests, educators, writers, who go up and down the islands with monotonous regularity. For two and a half hours daily, Tokyo broadcasts programs in Japanese, featuring news reports and governmental happenings. <laughs> Quite often they get very chummy and allow their tourists and relatives to send their greetings back. <laughs> and when Tokyo speaks, they all listen, rich and poor alike. So it's plainly a two-way proposition. Put them both together, and it spells Tokyo, I love you. You may see nothing but intrigue and conspiracy lurking behind every closed door and choking the airways with military information. I see islands of wondrous beauty. Sky-piercing mountains. Deep-driven gorges. Dashing surf and miles of colorful coastlines. Tropical skies. The world famous landmarks. Diamond Head. The upside down falls. The Pali. I see islands inhabited by people of many tongues of many lands living side by side in neighborliness and friendship. My islands are of many races, many mixtures. The total population is 423,000. There are 7,000 of us. I am Korean. Portuguese, 8,000. Chinese, 29,000. Filipinos, 53,000. Hawaiian and Pat Hawaiian, 66,000. Caucasian, 103,000. Japanese, 157,000. 
A melting pot, yes, but one in which everything literally melts. to which people from the world over have brought their colorful traditions and customs and adapted them to our American way of life. which say aloha to thousands of vacation-bent tourists yearly. Aloha. 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 Aloha, Nui. once ruled by the great king Kamehameha, and over which now in dignified splendor flies the flag of the United States. It's all down there, Mr. C. If you'll only take time to look. It's amazing how much you can see with your head buried in the sand. So long. So long. Sleeping peacefully, Uncle Sam? No problems? No worries? Everything in order, eh? Uh, go away, Mr. C. I'm tired. I'm tired, too. The whole world is tired. Why must you plague me so? I'm tired. Sunday morning on the island of Oahu. On a hilltop, Uncle Sam lay fast asleep, warned of the fire that was licking across the oceans from without, warned of the dangers that were threatening from within, tired from wrangling with his conscience and fatigued after a long, dark night full of disturbing events as indeed the year 1941 was, he slept in the early Sabbath calm. Safe and secure behind its military and naval ramparts, the city of Honolulu, like many another unsuspecting American community, was also asleep. 
At all the Army and Navy establishments on the island, after repeated warnings from the War and Navy departments, a number one alert had secretly been in effect for 11 days. This alert provided suitable defense against possible acts of sabotage and uprisings within the island itself, but made no provision against attack or invasion. At Hickam Field, the Army's bomber base, precautions were taken to safeguard the equipment against sabotage. Hence, on this Sunday morning, the planes were concentrated in hangars or lined up row by row on the open field. Immediately adjacent to Hickam Field is Pearl Harbor, the Navy's hundred million dollar fist. Here, on this morning of a tragic day of reckoning, capital ships, heavy and light cruisers, lay at anchor. At anchor, too, lay several destroyers, tenders, minesweepers, and repair ships. Eighty-six vessels in all. By seven o'clock, the city began to stir. For the most part, the atmosphere was serene and quiet. At Hickam Field, ground crews were at work. On a dock in Pearl Harbor, a few Blue Jackets idled away a few minutes. At Kaneohe, a field mass was being held. Shipmates, today is the third Sunday of Advent, the 7th of December, which means that Christmas is not far ahead. I don't have to remind you fellows that uh, the old Erlene is about to shove off carrying Christmas gifts and letters to the home side. Why not buy them a few presents? You might get, them, uh, get mother a pataki lei or little sister a hula skirt. I think they'd rather have something from little Johnny out here in Hawaii. This is the time when you're going to be missed so, send them a present for Christmas. But that letter is so important, however. Don't put that off. A few minutes past seven, an incident occurred at a temporary Army aircraft warning station. This station, as indeed the entire aircraft warning system, had officially closed at seven. But Private Joseph L. Lockhart, who had been receiving training here, was granted permission to remain at the station. While listening, he discovered something coming over the detector that alarmed him. He listened intently. Then, certain of his findings, he called the Central Information Center. An inexperienced lieutenant answered the phone. Excuse me, sir, this is Private Lockard. I believe a large flight of planes are approaching slightly east of north of Oahu at a distance of about 130 miles. Uh, must be our own. We're expecting some B-17s from the mainland. Thank you, sir. This incident, where it acted upon, would have given our forces brief but precious time for defense action and may have considerably affected the events of this fateful day. Regrettably, Private Lockhart's warning went unheeded. It was 7.50 a.m. by the clock on the Aloha Tower when the drone of planes was faintly heard. Out of the misty Pacific skies, like tiny locusts, they swarmed in from the sea. From the south. From the southeast. Sunday afternoon in Washington. Japan's smooth-talking, grinning envoys, Nomura and Kurosu, were blandly delivering to Mr. Hull a lengthy protestation of Japan's peace intentions. Yes, at this very deceitful moment, about 200 of Japan's messengers of death swooped in over our Pacific paradise. On they came, wave after wave, boldly, fearlessly. They had little to fear. They knew that our task forces were at sea, and they knew their disposition. 
They knew that no long-distance airplane reconnaissance, no inshore airplane patrol was being maintained. They knew from detailed maps they carried with them the exact location of vital airfields, hangars, and other structures. Each was given a specific objective, and straight toward that objective he came.
Commandantship. In the city, the people awakened by the bombardment believed the army and navy were staging large-scale maneuvers. Scattered bombs, incendiaries, and machine gun fire had changed their minds. One gentleman, when interviewed by a reporter, was stubborn and refused to change his mind. I don't think it is an attack by Japan. But you must have seen the Japanese planes. No, I did not. What about the bombing and gunfire? I thought the army and navy were having maneuvers. Look, Mr. Kida, you know that I know that you know that this is an attack by Japan. I have nothing to say. And judging by the smoke pouring out of your chimney, there'll be nothing left to show. I have nothing to say. The second phase of the attack began. Fifty minutes of perfidy. The last wave of the invaders was beaten off. Yes, beaten off by our men, who against overwhelming odds, heroically and magnificently gave notice to the world that we had only begun to fight. When they sneaked in, they were about 200 strong. Only about 150 when they departed. Behind them, they left about 50 of their planes. Most of them were scattered on the airfields in charred, twisted, and mangled wreckage. A few had crashed into the sea and were washed up on the shore. Some were shot out of the sky and plunged headlong into the harbor. 
grim telltale evidence that the list of dead Japs might have been larger and the list of our casualties smaller had we been sufficiently on the alert. These two manned submarines, three of which were accounted for, were especially built to operate in shallow waters such as are found in and around Pearl Harbor. This piece of underwater perfidy won't be forgotten. Yes, this, as indeed the whole diabolical plan of the attack, was conceived and aimed toward achieving one objective, and one objective only, to catch us off guard, smash our fleet, cripple our standing as a sea power, and put us out of business. In this it failed, but tragic and terrible was the scene of destruction. Heartbreaking, the sight of ships built to fight and die proudly, now left burning in shallow graves. Painful and lamentable the scenes at Hickam, Wheeler, Kaneohe, with barracks, hangars, and equipment, a mass of battered debris. Always, said President Roosevelt, always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. to read in amazement, in sorrow, in horror and disgust. Those also were President Roosevelt's words. Horror and disgust, amazement and sorrow. Sorrow, yes. Bitter, grievous, mortifying sorrow. For on this Sabbath day, 2,343 officers and enlisted men of our Army, Navy, and Marine Corps gave their young lives in the service of our country. Who were these young Americans? Let us pause for a few minutes at their hallowed graves and ask a few of them to make themselves known. Who are you, boys? Come on, speak up, some of you. I am Robert R. Kelly, United States Army. I came from Findlay, Ohio. My parents are Mr. and Mrs. James E. Kelly. I am Alfred Aaron Rosenthal, United States Navy. I lived in Brooklyn, New York. My parents are Mr. and Mrs. Henry L. Rosenthal. I am Theodore Stephen Zabo, United States Marine Corps. My hometown is Castalia, Iowa. Those are my parents. Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Zabo. I am Moses Anderson Allen, United States Navy. I lived on a farm in Cove, North Carolina. My mother is Mrs. Abby Allen. I am James Webster Late, United States Navy. I'm from Huntington Park, California. My folks are Mr. and Mrs. William J. Late. I am Antonio Estafoya, United States Army. I live just outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. My father and mother are Mr. and Mrs. Jesus Estafoya. I am Lieutenant William R. Schick, United States Army Medical Corps. My home was Chicago, Illinois. My parents are Mr. and Mrs. William H. Schick. My wife's name is Lois. You have a baby now, Lieutenant. He was born three months after Pearl Harbor. He's named after you, Billy. And you may be pleased to know he was born on your birthday. Oh, that's swell. Thanks. But tell me one thing, Lieutenant. How does it happen that all of you sound and talk alike? We are all alike. We are all Americans.
Tokyo is calling Nagasaki. Kobe, Ataro. His Excellency Premier General Hideki Tojo will report to the nation. For many years, the democracy of the United States has threatened to enslave the life of our peace-loving nation. That threat has now effectively been disposed of. I have the honor to report that our bombers have struck an annihilating blow at the United States sea power. The facts. Almost immediately, the crowing began. Let's listen to the facts. The battleship Arizona sunk a loss. Regrettably, that's correct, Mr. Tojo. The aircraft carrier Enterprise capsized a loss. Incorrect. That's the old target ship Utah. The battleship Oklahoma capsized a loss. Capsized, but not lost. Plans are underway for writing her. The battleships, California, Nevada, and West Virginia, permanently damaged beyond repair. Temporarily damaged. But just a minute, Mr. Tojo, before you go any further with your facts, meet Captain H.N. Wallen of our Navy. He is the Bureau of Ships expert on salvage and repair. Together with hundreds of civilian technicians, machinists, welders, mechanics, engineers, many of whom were recruited from the mainland and working in complete harmony with Navy personnel, he began a 24-hour, around-the-clock job of salvage and repair that will stand forever as one of the great achievements in maritime history. Above and below the water's surface, this epic of masterful engineering went on. Captain Wallen has proved you a mighty tall storyteller, Mr. Tojo. He calls your facts by a rich Navy word, scuttlebutt. And from the very moment the attack was over, he set out to scuttle your kind of scuttlebutt. Twenty-three-year-old California, known affectionately to our Blue Jackets as the Prune Barge, with her ugly wounds temporarily bound, was refloated and towed to dry dock. Similar attention was given to the 28-year-old Nevada and the 21-year-old West Virginia. Here in dry dock, in record-breaking time, they were overhauled and improved from stem to stern, from hull to peak. Now dressed in their up-to-the-minute fighting garb and raring to go, these mighty warriors and their proud crews stand out to sea. Godspeed. But wait a minute. Who is this saucy little gal, Captain Wallen? Why, George, it looks like the... Yes, it is. The mine layer, Oglala. A 4,000-ton surprise package. Given up and reported as lost, this former Fall River Line passenger ship was righted and refloated. Taken to dry dock, this small, dauntless craft was refitted and repaired. Now, spankin' new, this veteran of World War I again takes up her battle station. So you see, Mr. Tojo, how poorly your facts stand up. Sorry to have interrupted. That which is left of the Pacific Fleet is now in the southerly flight, seeking shelter in the Panama Canal. Before you were lying. Now you're fishing. All shipping lanes between the United States mainland and Hawaii are blockaded. And now you're wishing. No phantom ships these, Mr. Tojo but a huge convoy from the mainland. Three dozen ships, 
quite a number for blockade runners. And they're loaded to the gunnels with reinforcements and supplies. And here's a tip, Mr. Tojo. More of these convoys are on the way. Yes, convoy after convoy. Men in ever-increasing number. Supplies in ever-increasing quantity. For thanks to Washington's far-sighted program, we did manage before December 7th, despite many internal difficulties and disagreements, to build up the strength of our armed forces and start our factories humming. So that today, behind a heavy curtain of military censorship, Hawaii stands the greatest military and naval fortress in the world. Yes, virtually overnight, the island scene changed. War had come to America's tropical suburb, the Axis brand of war, a stab in the back on Sunday morning. The din of the last bomb had barely faded when Governor Poindexter proclaimed martial law for the civilian population. What kind of garrison material did these people make? Here is their vivid answer to Japan's sneak punch. Oahu's Civilian Defense Committee, 4,000 men and women, organized and trained before the 7th and working in cooperation with military and Red Cross officials, this civilian army and its neighbors went to war. Windows were taped in order to reduce the dangers from flying glass. Vital installations were camouflaged and protected by sandbags and barbed wire. Barbed wire, mountains of it, strung along every foot of Oahu's colorful coasts, strung across its highways, around its schools and its public buildings. Yes, war had come to the people in our island paradise, and the people dug in. Everywhere the earth was tunneled to provide shelter from shrapnel and strafing. Public squares, parks, and playgrounds were uprooted. Sturdy concrete shelters were built and distributed throughout the city. An efficient air raid warning system was put into operation, and for the first time in history, American schoolchildren were brought face to face with the grim reality of war. Even tiny little tots, confused and bewildered, were taught to march into zigzag trenches. How difficult to convey to them the why or wherefore of this strange game. Still more difficult to explain the need for these monstrous looking things. But the fathers and mothers of Hawaii did. For this war is a war of survival, a people's war. Even a little people's war, yes, right down to striplings and infants. A bunny mask, but no toy this. For this child, a grim memory of your treachery, Mr. Tojo. Well did the mothers of Hawaii, as they waited in endless lines for these bunny masks, remember the gas attacks in China. Well did they know that that which you tried in China, you were capable of trying here. But Hawaii is prepared now even against this possibility. Everyone has a rubber gas mask and carries it with him. From children as they go to and from school, to grown-ups, civilian and military alike. The people of Hawaii needed no pep talks on the value of rubber. This pile collected by them unmistakably proves that. Yes, all the people pitched in, the Japanese too. They volunteered in great numbers as blood donors. They liberally supported the war bond drive. And everywhere, this scene was commonplace. $25 war bond. Name? Onamayo. Tanae Kajiwara. K-A-J-I-W-A-R-A. Date? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The younger generation did its share and fully justified Dr. Shunzo Sakamaki's faith and trust in his fellow Japanese. Those that were known to be disloyal or undercover enemy agents were immediately taken into custody. Many were forced out of business and interned. 
But despite the wild Tokyo-inspired rumors and scuttlebutt, not one single solitary act of sabotage was committed on the 7th. Your bombs, Mr. Tojo, brought many changes and in no small measure served to further complicate the already complex life of the Japanese in Hawaii. As though to permanently erase their relationship with the homeland, they wiped out or removed every vestige of the written Japanese word, closed all the language schools, empty and boarded up the Shinto temples, gone the flag of the rising sun. This young American Japanese gave the best illustration that over Hawaii, the rising sun had begun to set. Thus, war came to Hawaii, USA. The Aloha Tower, once the symbol of welcome and hospitality, now stands clad in weird war paint. No longer do luxurious liners bring vacation-bent tourists to these once happy isles. The liners, too, have gone to war. No longer is Waikiki Beach the sun-kissed playground of the Pacific. Barbed wire has changed its face, too. Now, at twilight, the city streets are empty and deserted. Blackouts start each day promptly at dusk. Well, you may crow, Mr. Tojo. You've done a good job of stabbing in the back. You've darkened our cities. You've destroyed our property. You've spilled our blood. Our faith tells us that to all this treachery, there can be but one answer, a time-honored answer. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So that's the story of Pearl Harbor before, during, and after the infamous attack on December 7th. It's all true. You can take my word for it, because I know. I was there. I died there. Who are you parley-vooing with, buddy? Oh, just talking to some of our fellow Americans. Up here or down there? Down there. It's a waste of time. Oh, they're all right. That ain't the way I size them up. I ought to know. I've been watching them from up here for 24 years. Where did you get yours? On the Marne. Oh, you're a veteran. Ah, uh, to you rookies, yeah, but I ain't no veteran. Over there is men that fought the Redcoat with George Washington. Saw the general the other day. Open there, the boys of 1812, the Indian fighters. Up there is regiment after regiment of blues and grays. Back down Manila Boulevard, there's some of Dewey's men. My outfit's billeted up here in the new sector. Reckon they'll be opening up some more sectors now. Plenty of room for all of you. For you boys from this war and from the next. There isn't gonna be any next. Oh, where have I heard that before? Yes, I know. It's been said since the Bible was in its first edition. But this time, we're gonna make the, the world... world safe for democracy. The world safe, period. Safe for us to continue our democracy? Safe for any other nation who may choose to live under a democracy or any other book of rules, whatever its name. Just so long as they call a fair ball fair and a foul ball foul. Who's gonna do your umpire? Every nation. The Bush leaguers and the majors alike. If and when they prove themselves able and worthy to rate being called a ball club. I've heard all that before too, buddy. And no reflection on you, it was said better by a great man that's up here with us now, Woodrow Wilson. And what happened? America decided they didn't want to play ball to the International League, so they left Wilson out there on third base and they walked off of the field. When he tried to tell them that they're a big league club now and that they no longer play in sandlot ball, they sold him and his hopes and his ideals down the river. That was 1918, 500 years ago. This time you can bet your last Lincoln penny Uncle Sam's gonna be right in there, pitching. You taking any bets? When the last shot's fired, they'll take all of the Roosevelt, the Wallace, the Hull, the Wells, the Wilkie speeches. They'll pack them away in mothballs. They'll climb up on the bleachers. They'll eat hot dogs. And they'll watch the other clubs slug it out. Six will get you 12. That 15 or 20 years from now, they'll be opening up new sectors in here. You better cut down on the odds, soldier. Because when this ball game is over, 
A lot of guys are going to be struck out, that's true. But a lot of guys are going to be coming back to home plate. And they're going to ask a lot of questions. And they're going to have a lot to say about who does what and when. A whole flack of contracts and promissory notes is being dished out to them. And they're coming back to collect. My money's on them. And on the, the Roosevelt's, the Churchill's, the Stallions, and the Chiang Kai-shek's. I'm putting my dough on a ball slugger called Reason, on a pitcher called Common Sense, on an outfield called Decency, Faith, Brotherhood, Religion. Teams like that are warming up all over the globe. They're in spring training now. But when the season starts, they're going to be all out there slugging, pitching, feeling their way to a World Series pennant called peace. Yes, all over the world. In Australia. Belgium. Brazil. Canada. China. Costa Rica. Cuba. Czechoslovakia. Dominican Republic, the Free Danish Movement, England, Ethiopia, the Fighting Free French, Greece, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, India, Yugoslavia, Luxembourg, Mexico, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Norway, Panama, the Philippines, Poland, Russia, El Salvador, 